Okay, everybody, so picking up where we left off last time, we're going to set some preload on that bevel shaft, get those bearings and everything set up. We're not worrying about contact pattern on the gear sets yet, bevel gear to pinion, because that comes next. All we need to do is establish our preload on those bevel shaft bearings. We worry about the pinion after that. So we're just trying to do this simple, take it one step at a time. It'll make sense after we get it all put together. You guys will be able to watch the videos and you'll see the progression as I'm choosing to do it here. So, all right, here's the old shim packs that were in 1113. Of course, if you remember, they go underneath these bearing caps and that's how you adjust that bevel gear, not only side to side in that case, but also how much squeeze or preload is on both of those bevel shaft bearings. And I've jotted down the original starting point measurements for the shim packs on 1113. The left hand side was about 60 thousandths, th <laughs> 60 thousandths thick, sorry about that. Right hand was 135 thousandths. And as you can see, they're comprised of 30 thousandths shims and then a series of 5 thousandths shims, both sides. I have quantities written down. Here is the left hand pack and honestly it's in these are these are pretty good they're not crinkled up they don't have any bent corners usually if these d2s have you know had people into them numerous times these look a lot worse than what we have here but you can even see they they put a little dab of solder on these to kind of keep those uh, shim packs together and every time they have to peel one off they just put a little like a pocket knife in there and slice it off and good to go Let's see if we can roll it around here we're spreading a little bit you can see to the outside here, there's that thicker 30 thousandths, and then under my thumb is a series of the fives. So I think I'm gonna start with these shim packs and just see where that puts us preload wise on those bearings. Now, the reason you preload bearings is to keep that shaft and the gear and everything on a set axis, and when power is applied to them, pressure is applied to them, nothing can move, okay? These things stay just set right where they're right where you want them. And when you start putting pressure on a drive pinion to the bevel gear, all these things want to do is force themselves apart. So we're going to need to preload that shaft that that bevel gear is on so that when the pinion starts putting the power into it, it's not going to want to deflect at all. It's going to stay rock solid right where it's at. Now, say you were in a situation where you didn't have existing shim packs just to start from like we do with 1113. Going into the manual, it states to preload the bearings so that a torque of 50 to 60 pound inches is required to rotate the bevel gear shaft. To do this requires the removal of approximately 17 thousandths of shims after shaft end clearance has been taken up. So through trial and error, you would just assemble the bearing caps with shim packs beneath them that took up any of the side to side slack that you could feel in it or end play but the shaft still rotated freely. There was no bind in it and it didn't take any kind of force to turn it. Once you get to that point, if you could remove 17 thousandths worth of shim pack thickness, that should in theory, in theory, put you close to the 50 to 60 pound inch rotational preload force range that is the spec. But you know, we're real world here. We have increments of 30 thousandths and 5 thousandths to deal with. So how cat thinks you're gonna get to a 17 thousandths Shim change, I don't know. That must be more of that math with the alphabet in it again. But we don't have to walk that path considering we have the old setup to use and see how close to the 50 to 60 book spec for new bearings that puts us. That being said, on final assembly, my target's likely gonna be more in the 20 pound inch range, maybe 30 max, I'll explain. So in the last video, I mentioned how I don't put new production bearings on par with new old stock bearings, anything built 50 plus years ago. Reason being at the dealer, the real job where I work, I put together a lot of differentials and just about universal Ford pinion bearing preload spec is 16 to 29 pound inches. About 10 years ago, we started seeing short order bearing failures that were set in that range. Um, long story short, through trial and error, I eventually started setting new pinion bearing preload a little lower, a little lower. I found that if I could hit that 12 to 14 pound inch preload range, they'd last forever. Anything in that 16 to 29, within 10,000 miles, they'd come back noisy, rough, pieces were coming out of the races, rollers were chipped. I can't explain it. My personal opinion is it's a lower quality production bearing. And it's not just like one manufacturer, it's been across the board and it's been on bearings much larger 
than these. So my personal experience tells me drop that original preload spec and you're probably going to have a lot better luck with modern bearings. Of course, in the real world, you always want to stick to book spec. If you choose so, fine. I'm not recommending you deviate from it. I'm just saying that I'm going to. <laughs> So step number one is to get the old oil seals out of these caps. We don't need them to support the shaft anymore, and we don't want the additional drag that they're going to put on the shaft when we're doing our bearing preload measurements. Okay, and we are left side. So we'll take the shim pack, place it on the cap, and carefully assemble the cap to the shaft without damaging the shims on the studs. Um, another question was asked in the comments section last time too about why don't I pack the bearings with grease before putting them on a shaft. That's because grease will also create additional drag when you're artificial drag, I should call it, when you're doing your preload measurements. So I just have a light coat of oil on these bearings. 8090 in this case, it's just what I had here in the shop. And you know, questions like that are good questions. I never mind answering questions. Even though, well, I try to make it so the answers that I give don't sound like I'm being impatient or just being short with people. It's more because I'm in a hurry and I'm trying to answer a lot of questions in a short amount of time you know so sometimes my responses are just direct to the point they're never meant to come across as being you know impatient or anything like that because questions are good there's there's no such thing as a stupid question it means that uh, somebody has an interest in it and they want to learn and I'm more than happy to oblige so just giving you guys a little background information on that taking the seal out of the right side cap now and right side shim pack in place on the cap. Same routine over here, carefully start it all on the studs. And we'll start the nuts and then slowly draw them all down tight. We'll stop periodically to make sure we're not putting bind on the shaft in case these uh, shim packs are a bit too thick for these new bearings. And we'll see where, where it puts us, see where it all ends up. There we go. Torquing these nuts to 60 pound feet. These are half inch fine thread. Um, I'm going just kind of a uh, mid-range grade 5 torque value on these because we have fold-over locks that are going to be backing them up. I don't need to go any tighter than that. And I do like to maintain a set torque on all my fasteners when there are shim packs beneath them. Um, there is a certain amount of compressibility to those, and you don't want to just go crazy on them either. So we're not bound by any means, but there's preload there. See how the shaft just pretty much stops itself when I let go of it, so it doesn't feel excessive. Let's put the torque wrench on there and see where we're at. One thing you always want to do is put several revolutions on the shaft before you take a measurement. That just kind of helps center everything, equalize it all out. So. Once again, stop bolt comes into play. I tell you what, that is the handiest thing. I think I need that for every task on a D2 bevel gear except for cleaning it. But I'll probably find a way to use it when I clean it as well. So, all right, let's see if we can get this to where we can actually see what's happening with the camera. So, small little torque wrench here, beam style. Let's just see where we are. I'd say, rotate this around, get another view of it. I'd say we're running, well, we're right about, we're right about 20 right now. I tell you what, I'm, I am liking the feel of that. Yeah, we're right about 20. So honestly, I thought we'd have a lot more trouble than that. I can't believe that initial shim pack setup put us that close to where I wanted to be anyhow. 
I mean, that's uh, that's feeling nice. I'll tell you what, just out of curiosity's sake, I'm gonna pull a single 5,000th shim out of the setup, torque these back down. I'm just, out of curiosity factor, I wanna know where that puts us, how much higher that takes the preload. Okay, there's our 5,000th we're gonna take out. Okay, the bearing cap on the right side is torqued back down. Let's see what that 5,000th adjustment did for us. So, coming around, we're about 30 rotational. Breakaway is a little higher. Again, about 30. Breakaway torque is the amount of force it takes to initiate movement, to, you know, to get it turning. When you're dealing with preloads, the higher the preload, the higher the initial breakaway torque is. We want to pay attention to rotational, so... And again, we're right on 30 as we come around. So honestly, I think I'm gonna leave it right there. I'm okay with that. I, I'm i not comfortable going 50 to 60 personally with these new modern bearings. 30, I think is a good point. They can bed in a little bit as they wear, that preload's going to reduce somewhat, but we wanna keep good load on this bevel gear shaft, not only to keep that gear from deflecting, but also remember we're gonna have steering clutches that are gonna be pulling on each side of that shaft and 1113 I showed you earlier on how you can you could pull on the first steering clutch lever and the other one would pop forward so then you go to the other one and then the first one will pop forward again that indicated in play on that bevel shaft and not surprising with the wear we found on those old bearings so all right we jotted down in our notebook here the original setup gave us a 20 pound inch preload we took five thousandths I should also note from the right hand side Brought us up to 30, so I think we found our setup. Now we're not gonna put oil seals in yet. We're not doing fold over locks yet because we may still need to do bevel gear position adjustments once we get the drive pinion in there. That's gonna happen next time. This video was only about getting that preload set on that bevel shaft. We've accomplished that. Let's move on. All right, so at this point, I'm going to throw the reverse idler gear and the counter shaft into the bottom of this case down here. Reason why we're going that route instead of just bolting that pinion in and finalizing all of our gear adjustments is because all of that stuff can stay down in the bottom of the case. It's not gonna be in our way anyhow for when we have to do those pinion adjustments. But if we went ahead and just threw this in on top, which we could do right now, we could get all this figured out today, but then we're taking all this stuff back out just to put all these pieces back into the bottom anyhow. So like I said before, I'm kind of trying to follow the most efficient path towards getting this put together where we're not going in to take parts back out, to put parts back in, just trying to one and done, and we've got it in the books. So let's get started. Okay, reverse idler shaft and bearing have a light coating of gear oil on them. That's all we need for this stuff. New fold over lock onto the set bolt that holds all that in position. But one last thing I wanna show you. Even though I've been in through D2 transmissions several times, I always keep the manual out for these steps anyway because there's so many small mistakes you could make that could cause big headaches, you know, like when installing the reverse idler gear, the rounded ends of the teeth should be toward the rear of the transmission case. I'll go through and read steps like that every time I do them just to make sure I have the presence of mind to be putting everything together correctly. So this case, if we had that flopped, it probably wouldn't really change a lot other than it would be harder to mesh the sliding gear into the square edges on those other teeth. But we just wanna make sure rounded teeth here, rear of the case there, goes in just like that. No shame in checking the book. So I'll just pre-position the idler gear shaft. And I'll try not to completely block you guys out of view here with my arms, but gear with the bearing inside goes down and then slide the shaft the rest of the way through. There we go, line up the indentation for the set bolt. Now the set bolt with the new fold over lock. Jiggle the 
shaft, make sure it feels like we're engaged with the recess. Tighten it up. Cinch the jam nut. And fold the lock. Okay, counter shaft is next and we've got the gears laid out in the order and the orientation in which they have to go on here. Again, there is no shame in checking against the manual, so it does a pretty good job of breaking down exactly how they go. Just a quick run through, we have the second and reverse gear, large gear to the back, small gear to the front. We have the third, fourth gear, small diameter gear to the back, large diameter gear to the front, and we have the first and Constant mesh gear, small gear to the back, large gear to the front. So we'll feed the shaft through the bevel gear compartment and into the bearing race. And then we'll set the gears in place and slide the shaft through them as we go. The trick to this is getting those splines lined up. so with the shaft and gears in place we just need to install these pieces right here and we've got another video in the books so here's the front support bearing for that counter shaft now these are 307 w bearings common size open ball design like this now you remember when i took 1113's transmission apart i noted that we had this double shielded bearing put in and that obviously it had been replaced at one point in time because that's not really the correct setup for that this is also the bearing retainer that is original to 1113. You can see where it's so shiny down in there where the outer race was. And there's a step down here in the bottom. I bet it's 10 to 15 thousandths difference where that's evidence of a, uh, a failed bearing that spun and it just wore heavily into that retainer. So that's enough to uh, basically render this piece uh, scrap, you know. So we're getting rid of that. This is uh, 2115s bearing retainer housing actually and I had this uh, 307W that was very very lightly used things like new so that's what we're going with here gaskets front cover for that and then the various washers and a hardware to attach all this to the front of the counter shaft but I'll tell you for the wear that I found in this transmission 1113 put some serious power into the ground back in her day so first piece we have is this thrust washer here goes on the front of the counter shaft right up against that gear. Next, we have the bearing retainer. So we've got the gasket in place on the back of that. It's kind of hard to see down here, I know, but we'll start this kind of on the studs. And now you want to pay special attention. We're kind of rounded on this edge. We're rounded down here. We're rounded over here but we have a flat right here. That flat has to be up because it comes so close to this other cover that's just above it. That's the only way those things are gonna fit. So I'm just uh, lift this counter shaft a little bit. Get it kind of started with the bearing. There we go. Now we're gonna have to draw this bearing the rest of the way onto that shaft. And to do that, we'll take this heavy washer that is used to hold the bearing on the shaft anyway, but put a couple of longer 5 16 fine thread bolts through it with washers under the heads. We'll start the bolts into the thread holes in the end of the shaft and use them to walk the bearing the rest of the way on. And with the bearing fully on the shaft, discard the long bolts, put the uh, original bolts back in, new full overlock beneath them, and secure it. And finally, we have the lock tabs folded. 
so the front cover can go on. And again, we have a flat spot has to go to the top. Just be conscious of that. Gasket is in place behind it. There it is. So we might as well wrap it up about the same place we started today, looking at the end of that bevel shaft, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, we got our preload setting figured out for those bearings. And I do like how that spins, that is nice. We also got the reverse idler and counter shaft in the bottom of the transmission, a quick test spin on that. Again, liking it. Um, one thing I wanna make you guys aware of, it's normal to have about a 16th of an inch in play in this gear stack. You can hear that in gear pops back and forth a little bit. Honestly, every D2 I've ever taken apart has been that way and every one I've ever put back together has been that way. When, when I first found that, I was scared that, well, worried I should say, that it might cause like a rolling gear noise, especially like in neutral at idle with hot oil. It's never been a problem yet, so they are just that way. Next video, we'll start placing the drive pinion and sliding gear set. We'll get the backlash and the contact pattern all figured out there. Hopefully that is just as straightforward as finding the preload setup. I didn't expect to hit it that close to the mark on the first try, but sometimes we do get lucky, right? Anyway, thank you everyone for watching. I know I say that every time, but it's the truth. I really do appreciate it. And thank you for supporting the channel. Once again, memberships are available. I've started putting a live link to the join page down in the description below because some people are still having trouble finding the icon. It doesn't always show up on all mobile devices. So click on over there, see if it's something that you might be interested in. Remember, um, there's always behind the scene footage. We've been putting a lot of that stuff up lately and early access to the new episodes and ad free. They stay ad free for the first day over on the members page. So if you want to just avoid all that, that might be another route for you to take. But thanks everybody. I appreciate all the watch time. I appreciate the likes. I appreciate you guys sharing the channel, spreading the word. Um, we're growing and I think we're doing a pretty good job at it and I couldn't do it without every one of you. So Hope to see you back again.